Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So technically, when that book was written, women probably did not have a soul, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be. But I think um, uh, until the late 1800s, early 1900s, like 100, 120 years ago, uh, according to the church, as far as I know, the women had no soul. <laughs> So only men had soul. Don't look at me like that. I mean, it's not my, you know, uh, uh, you know, they actually had to have a vote to decide whether women ha can have soul or not. And it was a close vote. I think they won by just a, one or two votes. The cardinals had to have a vote. So luckily now you have a soul. <laughs> so, um, but that just goes to show you how much we have evolved in the past 100 years, 120 years. Uh, compared to 1,000 years, 2,000 years, how much we've evolved in just 120 years is unbelievable. And uh, so that book is about, uh, you know, it, it shows you what that science is like and all that and how the person's body became depleted, um, those kind of things. And, um, but it doesn't reveal too much information about the book. The book in itself is actually a pretty good book. I don't remember it at all. So I started reading it again. And not, not at all, a little bit, but it's, it's an interesting book, you know, because these things are, you have to understand, written in the 1850s or something. And 1857. Something like that. So, you know, when uh, Sri Yukteswar was maybe two years old, <laughs> he came out with a book. So, oh. you're talking about auras, you're talking about soul, oh. you're talking about reincarnation, about the existence of God, about spirit and matter, and the fusion of spirit and matter. And it's in Q&A form, the book. Um, and it talks about the spirit's book. Uh, that one is expensive. Huh? That's a US edition. So, anyway, well, you don't need to read that book right now. So, but it's got good Q&A. It talks about you know, it's a new concept in those days, how the soul is not the, the, the initial part of the book is basically about how the soul is not, a, is not the um, effect, but the cause. Because until then they said, okay, when your body dies, the soul dies. Or the, you know, the body, the soul exists as long as the body exists. So he has, he has written in the spirit book where the soul is actually the cause of the body, not the effect of the body. Anyway. We'll come so back to if this you book. go here in Google, um, Google, there's I think chapter one that's actually showing up. A little well, bit. So really you can just read a little bit and then if you like Read this book first. <laughs> yeah, you finish watch, this Watch book. the movie. It's, yeah, watch the movie. But it's not about the book. And uh, yes, and he, he does mention that this book also talks about God being the uh, supreme intelligence. Right? That all these mediums uh, had the same answer, regardless of where they were. Whether it was in, in France or whether they were in... Um, different parts of uh, not just Europe but other countries as well they had the same answer with reference to God so there were a lot of questions that he did ask the mediums and he got the same answer from all of them so a master technique you know interviewing people uh, yeah. different uh, people and getting the similar result and then he he's very good in uh, probably synthesizing and I think uh, yeah because he's a professor right his mind is very scientific and so what he wrote uh, is probably very very simple in in the sense but at the same time giving you uh, evidence in in the scientific sense that um, that can be validated to an extent with all these mediums anyways there was also a lot of other energies that were playing against him which yeah, is not so they call the higher beings i think uh, upper spirits or something like that yeah you have to look at it with this, some discernment also anyway that's it Right, so let's move on. Now Mr. we're going Kilner. to, yes, Kilner, Dr. Walter Kilner's work. This has got to do a bit with aura photography or the aura being seen, not clairvoyantly, but otherwise. And also uh, the, the distribution of the various parts of the aura. So that's what we're going to go back to, yeah? Yes, it's on Netflix, Priya. So you can try and get your hands on Netflix over the weekend or this week. So let's go. So the book that they're referring to is the human uh, atmosphere with reference to not the dense body, but the invisible body. And he describes that he was able to then use um, through, the, uh, through the means of photography to actually see the human aura, yeah? And so he says he used what's called colored screens or colored plates and was able to then help see this. And he also talks about a band, a colorful band that he looks at to be able to then see the so-called aura uh, or the energy field around the person. And so it goes on to say that uh, Dr. Um, Kilner's main principles and discoveries are summarized in another book. So if you want, uh, you can always refer to that book for further details. However, let's go to what he actually does. He 
you know, when I read the second paragraph, it reminds me of what people usually write in, in uh, journalism today. So it says, it is interesting to note that Dr. Kilner expressly, expressly disclaims all clairvoyant power, yes, uh, and did not even read accounts of aura until the 60 of his patients had been examined. Right. So they basically, they, they've not seen him do it. So they're trying to say, okay, man, this is all we know. And so after working with 60 of his patients, he was able to then bring this uh, to light. And so he says he claims, and so the word claims there, that his method are purely physical and can be employed with, by anybody who takes the necessary uh, precautions and, and the means by, by which he uses it. So what does he use? He uses basically screens that are thin, flat, yes, and then he uses a solution on that. Um, how do you pronounce this? Is it dicyanin? What? How do you pronounce this? Di? Dicyanin. Dicyanin. Okay, my chemistry is no always idea. very bad. Um, so that uh, dye in alcohol, and then they use for different purposes, different colors, right? Get Such goggles, as... Dyson and goggles now. Okay, so <laughs> maybe we can get those and try and see if it actually helps us see the aura, right? So various colors are employed nice. from different purposes, such as dark and light, uh, carmine, blue, green, and yellow. So these are the colors that were used in his sheet. Now, what does he do? How does he actually use this? He says, uh, he, the operator or the person who's trying to do this, he looks through a dark screen, yes, and then uh, at a light for just half a minute. After which, he then uh, looks at the patient's aura through a pale screen. So first the dark screen, then a light for like 30 seconds, uh, sorry, 30 seconds, yes, and then uh, the patient's aura. And he says that uh, what he found is that he's able to then see what he calls the aura. And he says, um, First, this is just temporary that you're able to see the aura, but as you probably do this more and more often, it becomes a, a permanent thing that you can actually see it all the time. <clears throat> so he says he perceives uh, the aura now because he's been doing it so many times, even without the screen. Uh, great care, however, should be done that your eyes tend to become a little painful in the process, right? So maybe for me what they're referring to is a different means of what you and i would call clairvoyance uh, helping people who are not at this point latently aware that they have it or are able to see it this is trying to help open it up so he goes to the next one where he says a dulled fused light yeah that's what he's going to be using is uh, projected right from behind the observer so if i'm the observer trying to watch my patient so behind me there's this light that is uh, thrown out and uh, I can more or less see the body of my patient in front of me. And uh, to be able to see this clearly, they either use a black background and in some cases a white background, right? Now, being in Master Chow School, I'm more used to the white background and I understand that. And then he says, to be able to see clearly, they keep the person 12 inches away from that so-called screen to avoid any shadows. And now, if you're a pranic healer, if you do, if you've done basic pranic healing, now, all this in now like, oh my God, do you remember that? That's the experiment that he makes us do. The first, what, two hours of the basic pranic healing course, you're supposed to actually try and see someone's aura, right? So teachers out there who are teaching this course, and uh, those of us, who, of course, who've done the course, we recognize this, right? And, and he does put a white background. He does make us uh, get the volunteer to stand 12 inches in front. And then of course, our gaze is not on the person. Uh, that's something that Master Chua has put in. So the reason for the 12 inches, which we probably don't talk about in the basic class, which is interesting here, is to avoid shadows and other optical illusions, right? Uh, so this is basically trying to somehow help a common man to be able to see. And so let's see what they see in that screen. So when, uh, sorry, in addition to the colored screen, he have employed another ingenious method, which is called the complementary colors, which we will call CC from now on, all right? So what, what does he do? This is what I spoke about, the band, right? So what does he do? He takes a colored band, two inches by three quarters of an inch, and this is a very colorful uh, band. So this is illuminated, and you have to look at it this time for 60 seconds, that's one minute. And uh, the eyes do get fatigued, and the colors that you see, 
when you when your eyes are looking at the band and then when you start looking at the patient you start seeing colors around the person yeah you so see that's the opposite the complementary colors sorry you see the opposite colors not the colors that you saw there so they say that the gaze is transferred then to the patient a belt or band of complementary colors is then seen on the patient. This doesn't seem very safe. I'm sure there's a medical explanation. Yeah, so this I'm not too sure. But anyway, since it's written there. Uh, yeah, so uh, so they say that the same size and shape as your original strip, this, spec this spectra uh, persists. persists for some uh, little time. And in practice, it is found that the color changes in the aura produce... Uh, produce the effect of changing the appearance of the CC band. So this part, I'm not too clear uh, how exactly it works because you're looking at the band for like one uh, minute. And then when you start looking at the patient, you see the opposite. Now, yes, when you look at, say, um, I think a blue, when you look, when you close your eyes, the negative is the opposite. Now, I'm not sure if it's called complementary color. You definitely see an opposite what color. What if they don't have that color? The point is not to see the opposite color. Yeah, the point is to see the color they actually have. So, <laughs> right. So, so this part, more or less, I, I'm, I'm uh, not too sure how to tell you about it, but rather just read it because I haven't experienced something like this at all, uh, especially in Masajo school. Nor have I seen anybody else do it. Right. So he says, however, a skillful person who does this regularly. Uh, in the hands of a person, he is able to then ascertain other details from the aura when he starts to look at it. Yeah. And he says, um, yes. And so the colors employed by Dr. Kilner, if you look at the next page, <clears throat> he's giving you four of those colors, right? So Camborge having uh, yellow. the CC that is. Camborge is like yellow. Yeah. Okay. It's so yellow, yellowish color. It's an amber, amber yellow. And it goes on to, uh, I'm not sure exactly what a Persian. Prussian. Prussian blue is. I'm used to it's other like blues. Which which one? Which blue is it? Prussian blue. It's like I don't know. Prussian. Okay, it's a royal blue. Like okay. the, it's actually the color of the year. Pantone color of the year. Of the and year. For interior designers, but yeah, it's classic blue almost. Okay, it's classic blue. Uh, for a painter, I don't think I still understand those colors. Anyway, then there's there's another blue. <laughs> Going back to again the yellow. Yes, and then there's uh, carmine. What is that now? It's a fantastic restaurant in New York. <laughs> you went back to food. <laughs> it's like a maroonish red or. Okay, red maroonish red, red going to red. an emerald green and an emerald green going having a, a reddish tinge. So anyway, these these are the colors, and I, they're talking about complementary bit. I this I, I guess, but uh, for me, it doesn't matter so much. So I would like to then go to the next part. I'll give Amit the first part and then go back to the aura and the three distinct parts. That's what I'm interested in talking about, yeah? Okay. The etric double, inner aura and outer aura. So you go ahead. All right. Now. What? <laughs> what? No, 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 I'm not ready to talk. There's nothing much to talk here. All right. What I do like is this book is called The Human Atmos Atmosphere, atmosphere. Right? Yeah, atmosphere. It's nice, right? Because you see, the atmosphere has layers with each one usually having a specific function. So, yeah. you know, it's a very, if he really meant to do that and I'm not completely off, it's like, I have a, you know, atmosphere. <laughs> uh, you know, I, mean, like, I don't like the atmosphere of this place. The human atmosphere is uh, in, not conducive to my atmosphere. <laughs> to my, I think, I, the yeah. atmospheric conditions in this room and in your body is not... Uh, we might lose some atmosphere with this. <laughs> so let's just get No, but work. you know, it's a good, uh, it's good. It knows that, it, it shows that he knows analogy. what he's uh, talking about, right? Anyway, so, and then the investigations he made, Sumi's explained everything. He <laughs> I explained everything. And he, okay, he was, he needs some necessary pain to see. Not to, necessary pain, the to eye goes to the pain. To see it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's some pains you go to. And then see. these are, by the way, this uh, dye is illegal, at least in the States, as far as I know. Yeah? So please don't uh, start by. Um, uh, okay, what is all this? All right, basically. The dull diffuse. <laughs> yeah. Okay, look, let's look at the mechanism behind it because um, what is he trying to do? What is he trying to do, right? Um, you have the eye and you have uh, the two eyes. The two eyes correspond to certain chakras. 
And when you're looking, you're not using your physical eyes, you're using generally those chakras. But you need a certain chakral configuration to be able to see clearly, clairvoyantly at that spectrum of light. Now, one of the ways of doing that is by defocusing your vision. And more than that cannot be said because that is part of a higher clairvoyance class. Um, but basically, it's like defocusing. You know, it's like, you know, um, you ever been teaching in a class or you've been in a class and the students look dazed, like they're glazed over, you know? <laughs> so it's like defocused, right? Daydreaming. Daydreaming. You can, they have this glaze. They're in another planet. Sometimes you see that with your kids. Anyway, <laughs> so I see that with other people also. While you're talking to them, <laughs> hopefully not. Uh, but um, but the, you know it's it's for defocusing the eyes. Now what they're trying to do is by squinting, by looking and straining the eye. Correspondingly, they're using the eye to create a chakral condition which will uh, enable you to see certain spectrum of light and certain energies. Without that chakral configuration, there are not that they're not that's the o- not the only one uh, that is. Uh, essential there are about three or four things that you need to do to be able to see clairvoyantly because seeing clairvoyantly is a science i mean like how do you develop it you just look at 10 20 clairvoyants you find out what is the chakral configuration if it's all similar then you look at non clairvoyants you look at their chakral configuration what do they have that they don't have how do you get what they have and then you get the same chakral configuration you should be able to see right it's reverse engineering the process so uh, what the mechanism behind this, I think what he's trying to do is he's doing all these fancy things with the cells, with the light, with the squinting and all that stuff to create chakral conditions uh, and to strain the eye so that uh, the proper chakras are activated. I do not know whether he knows that he's doing that. I don't know, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether he knows he's doing that, but I feel that's what's happening when you do that. The only way to make sure is to actually do the experiment and scan the particular chakras. If you read the advanced book very clearly, you know what the two chakras are or three chakras are that are in charge of the eye. So you know which other one is that. <laughs> you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have said that. Anyway, so so it's obvious it's in the book, but now it's really too obvious. Um, can you edit that? <laughs> anyway, so, um, so basically that's, that's what they're trying to do, okay? Now, with the lights, that is the other factor. Now, not only do you need proper chakra configuration, what you do need is actually your brain is able to process only certain amount of uh, prana. Like, it's not your eyes are used to seeing only a certain frequency of light, and your eyes are not used to seeing certain color prana, okay? Like, if you want to see a color prana called light whitish red, and that's why I was very careful in noticing what are the colors that they're watching. Uh, so if you want to see, say, light whitish red, or you want to see dark red or something like that, dirty red, your eye should be able to see it, or your, sorry, the chakra should be able to see it. And then more importantly, your brain should be able to process that information and it should be able to translate into having that experience that you're seeing that energy, right? So there's two parts. One is the uh, receiver part, one is the processing part, right? Actually, there are more than two parts, but these are two parts that they talked about. So what I feel, if I had to make sense of the second experiment with all the colors, that is very similar to a meditation we have in clairvoyance, which I don't know what they teach anymore. It's called the meditation on the rainbow or meditation on rainbow light, uh, where you our brain is sensitized to see different color pranas uh, so that uh, not only that your, your, it's entering your system, but your brain can actually process these colors. Right. And also remember when we spoke about the atomic web, we spoke about if there is that uh, tear or a hole in that, it causes hallucination. They're able to see what we call the, um, the inner world, right? And so the same thing applies here because he's trying to do something with that atomic web because all chakras have it. And through that, if he can actually open it, they might be able to see it. So this, this process, this experiment that Amit is talking about, uh, is probably to configure how to open that. But the problem is he does not know he's opening it and... Um, it can be dangerous. Yes, because sometimes if it doesn't shut, it's going to be... So maybe it does issue. two things at once. It uh, creates the proper chakral web, or the, that of a clairvoyant, and also it uh, um, sensitizes the brain with the colors. Anyway. All right, now let's go to something that's a little bit more interesting and more familiar. So the aura here, he says, he observes that it is distinct and he divides it into three parts. He calls it the etheric double, the inner aura and the outer aura. 
Yes. Now, the etheric double is something we already spoke about in earlier chapters. So just going back to what he mentions. So he says this one is uniform and surrounds the body. Yes. So taking the shape of the body to about 116 to 316 of an inch. It varies from person to person and also the same person at different times. So the size can change, but more or less, this is what they're, they're talking about. And so remember, we, we spoke about this bright kind of light, that kind of what you see. Even those of you who have done pranic healing in that experiment, the 12 inches of experiment, that's what you probably see, correct? So that's what we're talking about. So he refers to this and he says, the size is different with different people and sometimes even with the same person under different conditions. It appears to be quite transparent, yes, and distinctly uh, striated. So remember that it is thick, right? I mean, it's, it also actually has a little bit of a glow when we look at it. And so he says, uh, there are very delicate lines <clears throat> and um, it's a beautiful rose color. Now I've not seen the rose color, um, but they say that there is this rose color that appears Where in, in the, the tint, the in the tint uh, of those striations, mm. all right? So uh, moving on. So the rose color certainly contains more blue uh, than there is the carmine, which is that reddish color Anand was talking about. It seems portable that the lines are self-luminous. Remember I said that-, that Probable, thing, portable, yeah? not portable. So, oh, sorry, did I say that? I'm sorry, uh, probable, not portable. <laughs> probable that these lines are actually luminous. And so probably the reason why when you look at the person or even when we do the experiment around the palm, you can see this kind of luminous glove or, or like a, a sheet, a one inch sheet that surrounds the body of a person, right? And so um, they say up to the present, no attribution or change in the etheric double has been found that are likely to be a help in diagnosis. So this more or less remains uh, the same uh, at most times, yeah? And then we move to the next one, the inner aura. Now, interestingly, this talk of the inner aura being at the outer edge of the outer, uh, sorry, out, uh, outer edge of the etheric double. However, they also mentioned that it looks like it's almost at the surface of the skin as well. Yes, so they say, yes, it, mm -hmm. it uh, commences from the outer edge of the etheric double and frequently appears to be touching the cells, the body. And so um, now how thick is this? This is interesting. So they say this inner aura is uniform again, uniform width of two to four inches. So pranic healers, if you look at Master Cho's book, now you know what he's talking about. So they talk about it being two to four inches throughout, yeah? However, uh, sometimes slightly narrow around the lower limbs. And they say that when you look at this lower part of the limbs, this is more for the adults. Whereas for the young children, it is quite uh, thick. And so we also recognize as pranic healers that the lower chakras, yes, which are quite big for the little kids, obviously will affect the lower part of the aura, right? And with us, we prefer to sit and make the kids run around. And so we don't exercise much. So you'll notice that the lower limbs, the aura size is slightly smaller. So to move on, and it says, um, now after this, they go into this whole granular stuff, yeah? And so they, they say that its structure is granular, the granules being uh, exceedingly fine and so arranged uh, that it appears like it is striated. Yeah. So now we're going to the inner aura, uh, which again they feel has, you know, like those, those layers that are, that are happening. And the strides are parallel to one another. Yes. And being um, at right angles to the body. Right, so those lines are at right angles to the body and it bundles and the longest in the center and the shortest at the outer side, uh, which are, uh, which, uh, sorry, with a rounded margin. The bundles are massed together, thus creating a crenated outline of the aura and the stri stri uh, have not been observed to possess any color in Healthy people, in, in healthy. Yeah. yeah, in healthy people, they are less apparent. That's basically what they're talking about at this point. No, I just, in ill health. Sorry, in, in so when a person is not healthy, they don't see um, this being so strong. Uh, it's almost like it's, <clears throat> it's not very uh, visible. 
Now, the inner aura, the last line, is the densest portion of the aura proper. It is usually more distinctly marked and borders in persons in robust physical health. Yes? So the inner aura, compared to what you and I see as the etheric double, the inner aura is the second part that most people can actually see. It's also where most of the densest part of the aura tends to stay. So remember, the like we spoke about the layers, right, of each of the... Uh, different uh, segments from the physical to the uh, etheric to the astral to the mental. So the even in the etheric, in the energy uh, world, the densest stay closer to the surface. Yeah. And the more subtle etheric matter stays outside. And so they, they say that the densest portion, even in our aura, stays closer to the surface uh, that is near the etheric double, closer to the surface of the skin as well. And so just to go back to what I've spoken about, just the inner aura and um, to realize that it starts, they say, beyond where the etheric, so if the etheric double is this big, yeah, the inner aura would be after that, yeah, two inches to about four inches, continuing to take the shape of the body. <clears throat> now, they do talk about uh, the, the heavier energy staying closer to you. Now, we also know that depending on the health of the person, that inner aura can change. Just like they say that uh, with children and with adults, the energy around the lower limbs starts to reduce. In ill health, even other parts of your body, not just your limbs, other parts of the body, the inner aura can start to shrink. Now, when you have fever, which affects the whole body, it's not just one part, it will be the entire aura that starts to shrink which means that the amount of energy that you require to sustain healthy living at that point is not sufficient and which can cause a problem for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just end there and you can continue, mm -hmm. I'll add up those things later. So I, I, I don't see the point of this chapter. I think he's using it to um, just reaffirm what he's speaking about through the past 20 chapters. So he's just like summarizing everything before he goes into the, towards the end of the book. No, uh, but he's also talking about what Dr. Kilner found. No, this is his option. But he said the same thing. No, no, I know. So I think he's just adding to it. Yeah. But more but, scientific. But this is point. all Dr. Kilner stuff. Everything, the whole chapter. Yeah. So, so almost all of it. So I so think he's just using it as here. a, you know, as a reaffirmation and uh, which also gives it a summary. Uh, basically, I think they're talking about the ethic double, which we have spoken about in a lot of detail, the inner aura combined with the health race. All right. Uh, that's why uh, the inner aura commences from the outer edge of the etheric double. So if you notice, the health rays start from the about uh, almost at the surface of the body. Uh, but actually, the etheric double has all these pores on it. And from the pore, you have striations coming out and those constitute health rays. So it actually, it's both almost one. Masachua, Which is at right angles, remember? Right angles, that's right? right angle. So Masachua, I think for the sake of healing purpose, distinctively identified both of them because you have to treat both of them differently to in, in in terms of healing but if you are just talking in terms of just in relative because when they say something like um the inner aura is the densest portion of the aura proper what is that supposed to mean right the whole, all so, three. The whole right so so uh so it's a it's a that's the densest portion and that is why in the in the class you can easily see the uh, inner aura, but you can't, um, it's not as easy to see the outer aura because it's much, much less dense than the, than the inner aura. Even the health rates. Even the health rates, yeah. Health rates is easier to see, but, uh, than the outer aura, but the outer aura is quite, you know, subtle. So this is all no, you similar. You can just talk to them over the bundles. What bundle? <laughs> yeah. The striations, And then right bundles, up. the longest at the center and the shortest. I don't know why this, there's a difference. The longest in the center of what? Longs in the center, and then they're talking about on the outer side, it's it's less. I couldn't understand what that means. The longest because the in the, the center. And short. No, no, it becomes shorter, smaller as you go, if you look at the picture carefully. Ah, then that's what I think. The, most people's inner aura, they are not really strong. They look like hairs. <laughs> yeah. They're very, very thin. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, um, but as people meditate, as they make their energy body strong, the aura becomes more thicker, like cylindrical tubes. So they start changing in structure. Okay. Um, so the bundles are massed together, thus creating a crenated outline of the aura. The story have not been observed to possess in the inhale, it becomes less apparent. This Sumi is already explained. You can go on. This is self-explanatory. 
I've already explained a lot of this in the previous chapters, so like a lot. <laughs> so. All right. Now, the outer aura for me is slightly different from what um, Master Chua tells us in our books. So uh, they talk about it. So we're we just going to refer to it here. We're not going to uh, mention too much because for me, this is different from what I've learned. So they continue to say that the outer aura commences on the outer edge of the etheric, sorry, outer edge of the inner aura. So it's going, of course, beyond the inner aura, but they say it's only about two inches, right? And we know it's much more than two inches. So that's where I feel there is a discrepancy Same here. Same thing with the health rates. It's not two to four inches. And two inches is very small. Maybe in 1925, no, they, they were smaller. Inner aura <laughs> huh? is two to four inches. But that's also less. Yeah. Two is too small. No, the inner aura is about four inches, no? Four to five, five inches. But this is two is really like small. You're talking about 1927. Oh, people more active then. They didn't have, a, you know. Do you think so? <laughs> At least the inner aura should be big. The emotional, emotional aura and the mental aura can be small. Right? All right, so going on. So they say that. Um, it is rounded at the head, uh, extends about two inches uh, beyond the shoulder. By the size in the back, there it suddenly increases to four to five, right? So here it's about two inches and around here it becomes four inches. So it, it starts to change in the front of the body. And then again, a little narrower later. So then they continue to talk about how it follows closely, again, the contours of the body. Now for us in Master Cho's book, he, the outer aura doesn't follow the contours of the body. So I'm a little uh, puzzled about this. But later on, they change it. So I'm not too sure what they're talking about. I think they're putting it all together. This is what happens when you start using illegal dyes and the goggles and stuff like that. You can't make out <laughs> where it starts and where it ends. No, I'm serious. Good, good to start. This is very good information. But we have, uh, we have better information today. All right. So coming back to this, right? So they, they talk about it being two inches around the head, four to five inches around Two inches the head. this much, yeah? Like, like... No, two inches is about this. Yeah, two inches. Yeah, and then suddenly four inches here. That's what they're saying, around the trunk. And then they talk about that it follows the contours of the body. Um, and then after that, they say that it narrows down around the limbs. However, again, it's, it's more rounded, yeah? Now around the hands again, when it comes here, it doesn't kind of go straight out. They say it, it goes to a certain distance and almost disappears into space, right? So um, they, they're making it look very different from what I know. So anyway, so the outline is not absolutely sharp, but gradually vanishes into space. That's, a, that's what I was talking about. The outer aura appears structureless and non-luminous, right? I prefer to actually jump one... Uh, one more uh, of the paragraph and go to the next one because that's what makes sense to me when he, when he actually says uh, he, he considers the form a, approximating an egg-shaped oval, right? So I'm not sure where this body fit and everything, not body fit, uh, the outline of the physical body is and then how come it suddenly became egg-shaped because in his explanation earlier, it doesn't seem to make too much of a difference. Anyway, so to just add to what he says here, then he talks about how uh, young boys and girls, yes, they're very similar um, in texture, except that the woman's, not the woman, the young girls is more finer. And then they go on to say that if you look at uh, young teenagers and compare it to a male uh, adult, it's more or less the same because for some reason it's kind of elongated. So. There's a whole bunch of information given there. And then they talk about the women. They say uh, a, girl, a woman's... Uh, Where's teenagers? Adolescents. Okay, not teenagers. Adolescents. Uh -huh. Fine. And then they talk about the woman. They talk no, about the from female... From adolescence, it becomes distinctive. That's why I got confused. From adolescence onwards, the male and female aura become distinctive. It's not the same. Below, up to, say, puberty or adolescence, the, it's almost the same. Okay, so till puberty, it's almost the same uh, like the adult, right? And so that's no, why it's confusing. the male and female are the same. No, no, no. There's another part where they talk about the, the young adults and the... Oh, just read that yeah, paragraph. Yeah, children's... Just have a... No, just read that. That's different. Just okay, fine. In terms oh. of size. I'm sorry. Uh, so just going back. So the male and the female, like I said, is more or less the same. And then after that, it starts to change. Now, when you look at the female body, they start to say that the, 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 uh, the wider part, right, is at the sides of the body. 
Now, I'm not too sure why it's at the sides of the body. That's uh, the, the, the waist area. And birthing uh, hips. Birthing hips. I'm joking. I'm not it's sure. Just a it's, joke. it just bulges out. <laughs> Right, so I, I'm not sure about this this uh, variation because he's. I'm not sure if it's more than sixty people at this point that he's looking at. However, I like to go to the next paragraph, like I said, where he says it's approximate uh, to what you call an egg shape, which means it's oval, and uh, and the deviation from this is due to undevelopment. So if there is something wrong with that shape of the outer aura. There's something wrong with that person. So uh, we can then refer to that as, as a more perfect, uh, healthy outer aura compared to others who may not have it. Fineness and transparency may be considered an indication of a high type of aura. So we're talking about a higher type of aura where uh, this, this shape starts to become egg shape and at the same time uh, is transparent, which means within it you don't see these thought forms and other things that are, you know, well, that are kind of uh, affecting the, the actual uh, luminous ability that this particular aura has. Because with us, with all the dirty, diseased energy that is coming out and other problems that we have, we may not have an aura that looks luminous all around. We might have parts and segments that look dull, uh, parts and others that might have even other colors which are not healthy for us yeah so if it's looking nice and clean transparent and oval shaped then usually the person is quite evolved right or a high type of aura let's put it that way then they go on to say that children have auras relatively uh, border in promote promo, sorry proportion to to their height than adults yes and so these children's little auras sometimes gets confusing for them because um, because they say children also, especially male, have an inner aura almost as wide as the outer. So they may be finding it difficult to differentiate between the two, the children and the, uh, especially the boys and the adults, right? Then they go on to say persons of uh, intelligence. So they say when you look at the person who's more intelligent uh, or the interentia, as Master Choa says, he says you'll find that uh, it is more rounded around the head, right? And slightly bigger around the head compared to someone who's not so developed. And they say the color might also be grayish for them compared to someone who's an intellectual and who's actually working on itself, which means this, this for me, this upper part is in line with also what you call the energy centers or the chakras associated with your mental body. So when you develop your mental body, this part of the aura starts to become bigger. And so even the so-called undeveloped, when he or she starts to also enhance their intelligence, this part of the aura will start to change. And so that's why they're saying when a person has a good aura, a healthy or a high aura, this part will be big and the lower part right towards the limb becomes like an inverted egg compared to. And for the female, what does master say? Mm -hmm. The female outer aura? I don't know. Does he say anything? Master Chua? Okay, maybe I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong. But anyway, I'll that. verify that before I say anything. All right. So coming back, um, right? And so that's why they say there's gray in the aura for a person who's more dull compared to someone who's uh, more intellectual. So moving on, then they say sometimes an exceedingly face, faint haze can be seen extending outwards a very long distance beyond the outer aura. And they say this has been observed only when the aura is unusually extensive. It appears probable that it is a continuation of the outer aura. And this, and Dr. calls it the ultra, ultra outer aura. Now I'm wondering whether that extension that's going out of the outer aura is actually a etheric link, which is going to someone and the person hasn't, cut cords. That's, that's one of the things I was thinking of. But uh, beyond that, I can't understand why it is uh, going, extending only at one point, right? All right. Mm. Bright patches. They're going to they're gonna talk about it. Correct. So that I'm not too sure. Uh, it says, Now, if it is from all parts of the art aura, then it would probably also talk about something that something else that's happening uh, to that uh, being that has this particular aura. 
right? So when you look at Lord Buddha, or you look at some of these great spiritual teachers, you'll notice that their aura doesn't stay, you know, three inches or whatever, four inches around here. It really radiates. And that may be one of the things that they're referring to. So I'm not too sure if it's just one part that they're referring to or the entire part of the aura. And if it is the entire haze, right, this faint haze that you start to see, that would basically represent someone who, uh, who is very, very spiritually evolved at this point. Now, when you listen to certain very, very well-known speakers, not necessarily even spiritual, you'll notice when you are listening to them, it's almost like there's this, this kind of energy radiating from them going towards the entire audience. And if the, he has caught the entire audience, his aura or that energy, you know, that radiates, it goes all the way to the back, right? But if the person is not, uh, he has not been able to entrance his, his uh, audience, you'll notice that his aura stays, you know, just a little there and then what radiates goes only to a certain distance. Yeah. So that is another thing that I was thinking of when I noticed this thing called the faint haze that radiates out of the outer aura. And I presume in this case, it's, it's from all parts of his outer aura that radiates. And especially when he is communicating or talking to someone, that's something that I've noticed. Yeah. Oh, what? You know, when you talk about insomnia, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's my voice or really the book. It's not the book. It's just, it's just going around and around, but it's, I guess, 1925. But uh, those days it would have been good. Okay. Okay. So what are they saying? Number one, the first finding is that up to the age of 12, look, um, you have to study this because the way to understand it is not to just to read it one dimensionally, is to understand um, what are they trying to say? and what is the inference of the data that is provided here. So what are they saying? They're saying that up to the age of 12, the auras and shape and whatever uh, of children, either male or female, are the same. Now, after the age of 12, or when they go into adolescence, and when they undergo puberty, in other words, the aura starts to change. Oh, so what is happening during that time? Puberty is happening during that time. So there is uh, exchange of energies, right? If the breasts start to grow, the, the pubic area starts, there's more activity, the sex chakra, there's a lot of energy being set there to develop the sex organs, and the person becomes sexually mature. And also, so that could be one, that could be one reason. They're not given the reason, so we have to speculate, okay? That could be one reason why there is a difference, okay? Because obviously, the males uh, are sexually maturing differently than the female, so I hope there are differences, okay, in the aura at that time. And number two, uh, you have the upper aura, you have the middle aura, you have the lower aura. They are not talking, are they talking about the outer aura? Are they just talking about the aura in general? Or they're talking about, they might be by mistake looking at the emotional body or something like that. Because another thing that starts to happen, uh, the emotional body and the lower mental body starts to also mature correspondingly during the age of 12 onwards. Um, and when the sex chakra starts to develop, the throat chakra also starts to develop. Okay. And then the agni chakra. And obviously, if you look at a male and you look at a female, oh, it's so surprising to note that the middle part or the heart chakra and the, the emotional centers of the female is more sensitive or bigger than the emotional centers in the male. So the inference is that women are more emotional or sensitive than men. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be another speculation, right? So various speculations can be uh, inferred from this. I think these one of these two uh, could could be the reason. Um, then the second part is persons of intelligence usually have larger, a larger aura than those of low intellect. Well, of course, that is shown in Master Jokoksui's. Uh, if you've read the book Master Jokoksui's uh, Advanced Pranic Healing, it shows you that the size of the chakra is directly proportional to the intelligence of a person. So a person who is mentally challenged would have uh, smaller chakras. An average person has four to five inch chakras. And then bigger, an intelligent person has maybe what, six to eight inch chakras. And then a genius will have bigger chakras. And then an intelligence, you know, the bigger. So, the, so it shows that the size of the chakras are, co are, are co correlated to the intelligence of a person. So obviously, when a person is more intelligent, 
the chakras are bigger and hence the aura is bigger. Wow. <laughs> okay, anyway. What is this? There's so many words. Okay, so um, now, then the third thing is, now the colors, the beautiful colors. Um, <laughs> the more gray the aura, the more oh. dull. So, and the also colors. Obviously, the opposite of gray is colorful, right? You want something colorful. So there's, act in other words, there's activity, all right? Lo and behold, when you are reading something, you are using your throat. When you're understanding something, you're using your ajna. When you're intuiting something, you're using your crown. So as you become more intellectual, you're using the intuitional centers, the lower, uh, the wisdom, you're using the uh, understanding centers. If you've done uh, pranic psychotherapy or you have a background on the psychological aspect of the chakras and you're using the concrete mind, obviously these chakras will start to rotate or become more activated compared to someone who's not using them, right? Just like a person who is uh, lifting bodybuilding or lifting physical uh, objects will build his physical muscles compared to, uh, and will have more dynamic muscles, physical muscles compared to a person who doesn't lift uh, or goes to the gym regularly. So here mentally, intellectually, they've been lifting weights and they've been working on their upper chakras. And if you notice the colors, if you look at the advanced pranic healing book, basic pranic healing book, they're very radiant and very bright and very loom. They have a lot of colors in them. So obviously when they start interacting and they start getting activated and there's communication, they wake up. Uh, so there will be more colors. I think um, while reading, sometimes you're also touched by what the person has written. And so your heart sometimes gets activated. It might even uh, drive you to, to start doing something good or something new. Mm, true. Uh, sometimes it also drives your solar plexus, right? So then you say, okay, fine, I'm going to use this, you know, so I can become better or I can have more prosperity. So it, it can also activate certain emotional aspects, but I think the major awakening is on the mental level here they've specifically said intelligent intellect yeah, yeah, only right intellect. so that's why i spoke about intellect so they're yeah, i'm just about adding intellect. that okay um then um so children especially males have an inner aura almost as wide as the outer now when they say especially males they just said children and uh, children male and female have similar size aura now i'm <laughs> a little bit uh, Confused, so I'll skip that part. Sometimes an exceedingly faint haze can see for a very long distance. I have no idea what very long distance is for an author. It could be just a few inches more because if you have a four inch and then becomes eight inches, then that might be a very long distance because it's double the length. Or it could be a few kilometers. We don't know. It could be a thought entity stuck there. It could be anything. Yeah. So what is the point? There is no point. So we just uh, uh, learn it and keep it at the back of our head. And in case, because the word, when they use a faint haze, you see, when you use the word haze, it means something that's not clear, doesn't have proper form. So the thinking is not, there's no clarity of thought. You see, when somebody's talking to you, sometimes it looks like they're trying to fool you uh, and they go round and round and round and round. And you're like, what do you want? Just tell me, you know, get to the point. For you, it's obvious for them. They're not purposely doing it. It's just the way they're, they're working. So probably they have hazes. <laughs> You know, their, their mind is hazy. They have a lot of inner noise. So, um, so that could be it also. It's interesting, actually. It's very interesting. Correct. But, you know, just, the thing uh, is, when I heard that long distance, I was wondering whether it's just in one direction or is it, the, is it in all directions? That's why I said either if it's in one direction and it's long. See, energy uh, doesn't move in one direction unless it's projected. No, that's with what I'm saying. It could be the because the energy disperses, the right? So the thing is, um, because they have not specified, what is long distance? What do they mean by haze? You know, there are a lot of uh, uh, variables that, you know, are not clear. So that's why we cannot give a proper answer. Could be anything. So if you want to make your lower aura stronger, then you have to do a lot of physical exercises because the lower aura is also in charge of the health of your physical form. So one of the things they mentioned, like, for example, if you scan the aura of an adult who's athletic, you'll notice that their lower aura is definitely much stronger than uh, yeah. their middle sometimes, even, uh, <laughs> even the upper. So they look like uh, the opposite, you know, instead of the inverted egg, they look like a, the usual egg. So if you want to, that's one way to start working on your physical form. Yeah, that'll help uh, strengthen your lower aura. Um, now, does the middle uh, of the brain activation, that is uh, the middle of the brain, if you activate that, does it mean your crown is going to get activated? No, because I think the crown chakra by itself takes care of the entire brain. So the activation of your whole brain 
regardless of whether it's a middle side, left, back, behind, doesn't matter. The, uh, the crown will get activated or rather when the crown gets activated, the brain will get activated. It just depends on how you're going to use all that energy in the brain. That being said, I think before we close, you must understand that there's uh, always certain biases that people are exposed to. Now in 1920s, um, male and female were never regarded equal. So he could have just thrown that in there, you know, as uh, to not create a problem. You know, you never know because in my point of view, the sex of a person should not determine the aura of a person. The only way is the sexual uh, maturity because obviously male and females have different organs. So that way the energy can be changed. But in terms of emotional development, although I did say, yes, women might be more sensitive in general, maybe in those days, but generally, I mean, like you have uh, two, you cannot just say two male uh, babies, uh, you know, uh, or two male adolescents when they are four, 15, 16, their aura will be uh, different from, uh, you know, another one. And I cannot say that a, a, ba a kid who's eight year old, a boy, will have the same aura as a girl who's eight year old. I mean, um, or for that matter, I don't know how he's measuring. Like two, two eight year olds uh, can have very different auras. I mean, it's the soul Today, yeah. and the intention of the soul, which has come into the body for that purpose with that vehicle and, and has a certain amount of development. So that's why you have the aura. That's why Master Cho and the books have written um, that there are certain, in the Achieving Oneness books, there are certain uh, highly developed uh, uh, souls that have incarnated in young, you know, just incarnated so they have young bodies, but their chakras are relatively big. So for them, they can do meditation to enhance earlier than uh, other people would because their chakras will be able to process it. And if their chakras are bigger, then obviously the aura is completely different. But I don't know, that is not the norm, but that is today. Now, if you look at 1925, maybe, maybe that is the tendency to add to what you're saying maybe that is possible because uh and you know, also the, sorry and also women got married at like what 14 15 after adolescence right in those days <laughs> so you know like obviously their auras would change they're very young so so i think also um if that's the way the society looked at male and female you it's, it's almost in your system. Until there's some great person, great teacher who tries to help you see beyond, you might see society like that and you think it's the norm and it's okay, right? And so when you um, write something, it's in line with probably what society thinks. For example, for, for many of us, we might have seen life, religion very differently before, for example, Master Choa helped us see things very differently. Right. So uh, those things, whether you see your child, you don't realize your child is not yours anymore. Your child is a soul that's been entrusted to you. You have to take care of it. And then hopefully they find their own way and they find their own destiny. Whereas if you look at our parents or our grandparents, for them, they had to decide how the child grew up and what he or she should do. But today, you and I know that's not how it's supposed to be. So you have to keep in mind that bias can translate into written works, even with intellectuals or more developed people. Yeah. I've seen even how uh, yogis not being able to develop yogis and even Master Chua has told us this, develop yogis not be able to go over their, their, their like got blinders. So because their conditioning, inner, what Master Chua I think used to call inner conditioning has been, uh, you know, going on for so long that they cannot, even though they're developed, they cannot see things from a different way. That's why they have sometimes puritanical attitude, attitude although yeah. So, and so that's why Master Chua says he says uh, only when the older generation die, the ideas die with them, so that new ideas can actually develop. It's not that the ideas suddenly die; it's just that the people who are carrying those ideas are gone, and so life starts to change. and And that's how life is. And hopefully, uh, with the way we are starting to think, the future, the future generation will start to think uh, probably in a more open in an open way uh, where hopefully more intelligence doesn't segregate them, but unites them. Yeah. All right. Sure yes. That so that's that. Anything else? Mm -hmm. uh, well, they haven't yet spoken about the interpenetrating of different people's auras yet. Maybe it'll come a little we later. We take that as obvious because of Master Choa, but honestly speaking, I don't know whether I would have figured that out if I was just looking at an aura. Right. So, so if he's too close to his subject, <laughs> No, you I never like, know yeah. how that influences the aura of the patient as well. Yeah, okay.
I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Deepa has answered the question about the. Thank you. Okay, people. So we'll meet you on Wednesday and we'll Wednesday. continue with this. Mr. Yeah. Kilner. Few, yeah, Mr. Kilner. Not the glass, not the stop bottle. It's a bottle, right? Kilner okay. bottles. Storage. Right. Okay, so let's close our eyes, connect onto the palette. Let's end our session for today. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grandma Sucha, Coxilot Maha Guruji Mehling, to all the great ones, to all the holy masters, holy gurus, healing ministers, healing angels, the great teachers and beings of theosophy, the great beings of knowledge, light and wisdom, to all the angels and beings of communication, to our soul and divine self, we thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your patience with us. Thank you for helping us have a greater and clearer understanding. And help us to assimilate this knowledge to become better instruments. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy you. your evening. Atma Namaste, and we'll catch you soon. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Let me just first yeah. stop. Bye. Ending for all. Enjoy your dinner. Bye bye. <laughs>